Szép jó napot kívánok mindenkinek, kedves kollégák, akadémikus társak, minden megjelentnek a Magyar Tudományos Akadémia Földtudományok osztályának nyilvános ülésén, ami egy nyilvános előadó ülés, aminek egyetlen napi rendi pontja van. Stephen James Moyes az MTA külső tagja székfoglaló előadásának megtartása. Engedjék meg, hogy ismertessem Steve életrajzát. Stephen James Moyes is geológus, geokémikus, az Egyesült Államokban a Kolorádói Egyetem föltani tanszékének rendes professzora, valamint a Tokiói Earth Life Science Institute vendégprofesszora. Kutatói arszpoétikája, hogy a Földre úgy tekint, mint egy hatalmas, összetett és könnyen hozzáférhető laboratóriumra. Bolygónk ugyanis a jelenlegi és a múltbeli geokémiai folyamatok megértésének alapját szolgáltathatja, vizsgálatával a lakható bolygók kialakulási folyamatainak megértéséhez juthatunk közelebb. Mojzsis professzor szerteágazó kutatási tevékenysége ezen folyamatok különböző területeit célozza meg, komplex módon alkalmazva a magmás és metamorf közöttan geofizikai modellezés, stabil és radiogén izotóp geokémia, geokronológia és nyomelem geokémia eredményeit. Egyik fontos kutatási területe a korai földkérek kialakulásának vizsgálata. A geokémiai adatok és numerikus modellek összevetése az első néhány százmillió év folyamatainak megértése céljából. A kisbolygó becsapódások által keltett hő modellezésével és a legmodernebb korhatározási módszerek alkalmazásával új eredményeket jelentetett meg többek között a kéreg, olvadási és differenciációs folyamataival, valamint a nyugat-ausztráliai Jack Hill legősibb cirkonjainak keletkezésével kapcsolatban. Különböző izotóp geokémiai elemzésekkel nem csak a Föld legidősebb kőzeteinek korát határozta meg, hanem felderítette a koradatokat módosító folyamatokat is. Kimutatta, hogy az Akasztag Neis Kanadában kb. 4 milliárd éves kőzetei a legkorábbi a Föld keletkezését néhány százmillió évvel követő kéregképződési események nyomait rögzítik. Aktívan foglalkozik a nagy jelentőségű sávos vasérc formáció kutatásával, amelyek az élet létrejöttének legkorábbi nyomait őrzik. A fém alapú enzimek képződéséhez kapcsolódó nyomelem geokémiai kutatásai az evolúció folyamatainak megértését segítik elő. A kobalt és nikkel geokémiának elemzésével a mikrobiális élet fejlődéséhez szükséges nyomelem ellátás jelentőségét és a korai tengervíz összetételének változását is sikerült kimutatnia. Megállapította, hogy az oxidatív légkör kialakulása a korai ultrabázisos vulkanizmusra visszavezethető eredetű nikkel és kobalt tengervízhez kötött tengervízből történő kicsapódásához, és ezzel az élő szervezetek számára elérhető nyomelem tartalom csökkenéséhez vezetett, amely a cianobaktériumok elteredésének lassulását eredményezte. Fenti kutatási területek mellett Jelentős tudományos előrelépést hoztak a megismerés területén az exobolygókkal kapcsolatos kutatása is. A magyar kutatókkal többek között a geomikrobiológia és a planetológia területén alakított ki gyümölcsöző kapcsolatot. Az MTA meghívására vendégkutató professzorként négy hónapot töltött a Csillagászati és Földtudományi Kutatóközpontban, amelynek eredményességét a hazai társszerzőkkel írt közös, szakterület vezető folyóirataiban megjelent publikációk is jelzik. A hazai tudományos élettel való kapcsolata új minőséget nyert, amikor a Magyar Tudos Tudományos Akadémia közgyűlése 2016-ban külső tagjává választotta. Kiemelkedő tudományos munkásságát jelzi, hogy a nemzetközi folyóiratokban megjelent 70-nél több publikációjára, még között 5 Nature és 4 science is szerepel, több mint 5000 hivatkozást kapott, H-indexe pedig 34. Számos nemzetközi tudományos szervezet tagja, tucatnyi fokozatot szerzett tanítványa jelzi, hogy a tudományos utánpótlás nevelést is szívügyének tekinti. Stephen James Moyes az 1956-os forradalom és szabadságharc után Magyarországról kivándorolt szülők gyermeke, 52 éves, nős, három gyermek édesapja. A régi családi kötelékek erősítését szolgálja, hogy amerikai és ír állampolgársága mellett kérelmezte a magyar állampolgárságot is, és elismerésre méltó szorgalommal ápolja és fejleszti magyar nyelvtudását. 
Kérem, hallgassuk meg együtt Stephen James Moises székfoglaló előadását. Magyarul kezdi, talán megbocsátható módon az összetett geokémiai magyarázatok során angolra vált. Minden esetre a székfoglaló előadásának címét hadd jelentsen be. Földünk a legkorábbi időkben, illetve before life. Steve. Fáradt vagyok utána. <gül> Nagyon szépen köszönöm, kollégák. Először jó napot az MTA munkatársaim. Ma eladásomban eladást és céljámait kívánok eladni a magyar nyelvű priambulom, priambulom békézésben. Mielőtt a részletesebben megmagyarázhatnám, amit az első anyanyelvem, angol nyelvemnek nevezhetnék. Őszintén remélem, engedsz magadnak, <gül> miközben gyakorlom, hogy javítsam a sajátos nyelv nyárást és a magyar kiejtést neked. Eladásomban egy ilyen történelmi és valóban híres intézményhez, amelyet az Amerikai Egyesült Államok Nemzeti Tudományos Akadémia már évek óta előzött és megnevez. Szeretnék kifejezni összinte meg becsülésemet és valóban alázatosságomat, hogy a tisztelet megszerezésében részésüljek. So, Címe, korai föld az élet meg jelenésével szemben. Ma a mai utazás során szeretnék kifejezni köszönetemet Temény Attila, Pálfi József, Ábrahám Péter, Hás János, Kis Csaba és Pap Gábor. Ráadásul Újvári Gábor. Hips Kinga és természeten Ákos keresztori iránt. Számos kollégám van, akat megnevezhetek, de az eladásom majdnem felére lesz, mi, mielőtt elkeszültem. Hadd kezdjem azzal, hogy felsoroljuk a világszerű föld létrehozásának négy kritériumát, ami alkalmas az élet eredetére. Először szerves nyersanyagok. Ingyenes energia, az diszequilibriumtól és folyékony víz és idő. Az, az talán az egyik legfontosabb dolog. És a bázis nekem az élet akkor merül fel, ha a fenti feltételek teljesülnek. De az első lépesek a legnehézebbek. Az a gond előttünk. Ebben az időben átterjék az angolra és az eladásom technikai részleteire. Még egyszer köszönöm a kedvességedet és tűrelmét. Ah, probléma van. Ja. An old idea. I like old ideas. What's wrong with an old idea? Except when it's wrong. Here's an old idea. The idea comes from the term Hadean, after Hades, which describes in 
uh, Judeo-Christian mythological worldview, a very hot place, molten, inhabited by devilish characters. However, Hades in the Greek mythos was a dark and mysterious place of hidden knowledge. And therefore, it is fitting that when we talk about the time on earth before life, that we should describe it as a place not as hot and hellish, but instead as dark, cold, and mysterious. My presentation today has two themes. The first theme is that the Earth's mantle, the 67% of Earth's volume, has changed all very, very little in over 4 billion years. When I talk about the evolution of the mantle, I discuss the redox state, the fugacity of the mantle. In other words, the theoretical partial pressure of oxygen in equilibrium with the mantle mineral assemblage. That theoretical partial pressure of oxygen describes the availability of electrons. Electrons are important for the following reason. When people talk about the habitability of life in a planet like the Earth, you have to look at the entire Earth, not just as an avocado. Earth is like an avocado. If you cut open an avocado, the interior is dominated by a big seed that is Earth's core. The, the volume proportion of an avocado seed to the part you can eat, to the volume proportion of Earth's core to the mantle, is about the same. So the part we worry about is here. This part is part of a battery, a battery that links the biosphere at the surface with the mantle and the atmosphere. In this case, electrons flow from the mantle to the crust. Life is at the interface where a film of water exists at the top. So much like, much like the skin of an apple, most of the earth is the, is the part you can eat of an apple and the seeds. With a, in a planet that does not have that flow of electrons, because it is thermodynamically at equilibrium, there can be no life. A planet like Venus is, is in this state. Mars is also in this state. The only, only habitable world in this solar system is the Earth. It is not Europa. It is not Ganymede. It is not Callisto, it is not Venus, it is not Mars. It is Earth because Earth has a battery. How do you make a habitable planet in the cosmos? You have to satisfy that criterion. It is the simplest, most fundamental criterion, yet people forget about this for some reason. I feel very uh, worked up about that. <laughs> Furthermore, the crust is a platform for early life. Any discussion of the time before life must take into account the geology. In the absence of Earth science, biology is a complex game of mixing organic chemicals and playing Mary Shelley to your Frankenstein. The crust is a platform for early life, but to understand it and to understand any Earth-like planet in the cosmos requires our understanding of the crust's antiquity, volume, and complexity. That is my talk today. Now, the first part is mantle redox evolution. Here's an image of a bucolic landscape somewhere in the Mediterranean. This landscape uh, composed of liquid water ocean and an atmosphere 
defines our planet. Arthur Clarke, the famous science fiction author and scientist, once asked, why do we call Earth Earth when it is so obviously ocean? So I would like you to change your perspective a little bit and uh, think about a time when the planet was dominated by this even more so than today. But what was the nature of this planet? Building planets requires an input of primitive materials like meteorites. And in building a planet, something we must not forget is that planets are built continuously. They, they aren't formed all at once and they aren't formed over a slow, protracted process. Planet formation is like war. It's long periods of boredom interspersed with terrible times of extreme terror. So a building a planet follows a path like this, and there's a big mass addition, and then it moves along, and then there's another big mass addition. In the process of growing a planet, another thing we must keep in mind is that the chemical conditions change. Just because we're studying planet formation and just because we're interested in the origin of life does not mean that we should forget our basic physical chemistry. In physical chemistry, of course, there are rules, and these things are called partition rules. As a planet grows, of course, it becomes larger and larger, and the pressure and temperature conditions become greater and greater, which changes phase diagrams. So small planets have different mantles than big planets. Indeed, something I wish everyone to take away from today's lecture is that the larger the planet, the more oxidized its mantle becomes. This is important. Because any discussion of Earth, uh, another Earth around another star of another age, and if the star, if the planet is bigger than the Earth by 10%, by 50%, by 150%, its atmosphere must be dominated by oxidized sources. I will show you why in a moment. Earth is, and Venus are right at the oxidized level. The importance of that has to do with the gases that come out to make the atmosphere because they're intrinsically oxidized. Geologists have known this for over 80 years, but because origin of life studies did not consult the geologists, much of the studies have been dominated by ideas that the early atmosphere was very rich in electrons, like a hydrogen-dominated atmosphere. Now, there's good reason for that, because organic chemists, especially synthetic organic chemists, are very, very clever people. <laughs> this was my professor here, Stanley Miller. This is when he, was, uh, he had less uh, enthalpy. Um, this was in 1952. He has achieved full entropy now. Uh, as of about six years ago. But the evolution of oxygen fugacity in the Earth's silicate mantle is crucial in our understanding because it affects the speciation and mobility of volatile elements in the interior. Any speciation of volatile carbon compounds, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, and so on, will be determined by the oxygen fugacity. An important point, Miller and his advisor Harold Urey at the University of Chicago proposed, following work uh, that was um, initially supposed by um, Alexander Oparin and also Haldane, that Earth's atmosphere was captured from the solar cloud and was dominantly methane, hydrogen, ammonia, and water vapor. 
in this apparatus here, they used a discharge, not a lightning. Now, this is, no, what they, it, it's static cling. It's discharge, like in, uh, at night in the winter, and you're in bed, and, or you, you take your sheets, and you see little sparks everywhere. Because if you use lightning here, it destroys chemical compounds. It makes oxidative radicals like O dot, and the reaction is destroyed. But they used a passive static discharge apparatus and made many, many, many amino acids, the precursors to proteins. This was a spectacular result that set us back 80 years because the result was fascinating. And the uh, New York Times in 1953 had on its masthead, we are close to understanding the origin of life. We are as, as far, if not farther away now from that understanding than we were in 1952, but be that as it may. Geologists, on the other hand, including W. W. Ruby and C. Lane and many others, pointed out that this was impossible. <laughs> and besides, the experiment here was already performed in 1906 here by Walter Loeb, a, a, uh, a German chemist who used damp carbon monoxide and also found alanine and a few other amino acids. Furthermore, studies of ancient earth rocks show that earth's oxygen fugacity has changed very little, at least in three and a half billion years. Well, that's bad news for that. Indeed, this experiment was probably closer to reality than this experiment. Nevertheless, there's been some important recent progress in this regard. And the progress is spectacular. I just love this. This just, because as geologists, we like direct analysis. You know, don't tell, you know, if you want to send me a love letter, write it in a, postcard and, you know, make sure the postage is correct. But if you, if you really want to tell me how you feel, show me. In this case, uh, this is work by uh, my former student, Dustin Trail, who's now a professor at University of Rochester and UCLA. And this is age uh, in uranium lead space of zircons up to 4 billion 300 million years old. And what Dustin did was something awesome. And he was my student, so I'm very proud of him. I'm proud of all of my students and postdocs. Well, Dustin showed that cerium, one of the uh, rare earth elements, is very sensitive, of course, to oxidation. Now, cerium could be in the three plus state or the four plus state. Most, uh, most cerium, as we learned in elementary school, uh, is in the three plus state. But cerium redox can be controlled in the oceans by organic matter, as Ed Goldberg showed us in the 1950s. But in mantle at melts, it is strongly controlled by iron speciation. So iron, if it's in uh, iron 3 plus will help oxidize cerium to the 4 plus. Cerium 4 plus, uh, it has trouble fitting in the lattice of zircon. So what Dustin did is he made uh, cerium here as a uh, redox barometer, a redox meter. And he measured it in zircon. And he found that back to 4.3 billion years ago, the field of oxygen fugacity is very much the same, which a few excursions to lower redox. Well, we've expanded this. Here's a paper that I just submitted uh, where I took my data from all these previous studies here. And I found that for younger rocks, the range of values here is quite similar. Now, if I were you, I would say, Stephen, how come these are out of this field? So what are you trying to do? 
Well, I'm showing you something I think is very interesting in these data. The way you get these big excursions here in contemporary melts, this is magnetite hematite, highly oxidizing, is by addition of water. You have to subduct water, and then the water disproportionates. Hydrogen goes into uh, crystal lattice, and OH goes into other crystals, depending on the structure. How do you get this? Well, uh, very reduced magmas tend to be in equilibrium with graphite. Where does graphite come from? Eon Zen and others have shown that highly reduced melts are from subducted organic matter. So this presupposes a discovery from two years ago by Bell, Harrison, Benke, and Mao, published in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, the presence of graphite inclusions in zircon, 4.1 billion years old, that are isotopically light. Delta C13 value minus 30. Is it proof of life? No. But in geology, we have a time machine. Since then, uh, lunar rocks have also been analyzed. Now, this is a key point going back to mantle redox. Earth is a big planet. It's one Earth mass, the last time I checked. The moon here is uh, 1% of Earth's mass. So, moon has a very, very small core and a big mantle. The core mantle boundary condition of the moon is very low pressure, very low temperature. Under those conditions, the mantle should be reduced because it is dominated by Fe0 and Fe2+. As a mantle gets larger, the pressure temperature condition changes, and you destabilize iron 2. So what happens is iron naught disproportionates to iron metal, which goes into the core, and iron 3 which goes into the mantle, and it raises the oxidation state. Every super-Earth that you ever read in CNN.com or, I don't know, or you know, something, is probably dominated by carbon dioxide and is Venus-like. Keep that in mind. This is why Dan Frost showed this that as the Earth uh, increases its fraction here, here's a mass addition now, the oxygen fugacity goes up. And the reason is iron metal here, droplets, they disproportionate here, and you make uh, iron 3 plus and iron naught going into the core. In a smaller planet like the moon, this does not happen. What about this place? This is Mars. Mars is interesting, but I told you that I don't think it's, it contains life because it doesn't have the battery. Mars has another problem. Mars is small. Mars is not quite 11% of Earth's mass. What do you think its mantle oxygen fugacity is? Students, this is going to be on the exam. <laughs> is it high or low? Mars is oxygen fugacity. Who says it's high? Thumbs up. Who says it's low? You all get A+. Plus. Exactly. It's 10% of Earth's mass. The core mantle boundary conditions are such that it stabilizes reduced iron. Something amazing happened in 2011. This meteorite was discovered. There's a three centimeter here. That's three centimeters across, like this. It's a meteorite. It was discovered by some uh, Berber tribesmen in Morocco on the other side of the Atlas Mountains 
in the desert south of Wazazat oasis. And these guys, you, they make a living, right? I mean, there's not too much money you can make selling a goat. Goats are cheap. However, if you find a meteorite, you can make extra money. So they, they take a long stick, like from a shepherd's staff, right? Yuha sok, right? So, and then they put a magnet at the end of it. And they go along the desert floor like this. And if the magnet sticks to a rock, they put it in their pocket. And after a day of picking up rocks, they go back to the village and they put it on a table, and a Frenchman comes by, you know, with a beret and a mustache and a baguette and all that. And he goes through the meteorites. He says, yes, we, oui, no, we, oui, no, we, oui, no, we, oui, no, we, oui, we, oui. oh! Well, one of them was this, Northwest Africa 7034. You see they had over 7,000 already. We're in the 10,000s now. This one is from Mars. It's a piece of regolith. It has Martian soil in it. It has many pieces, including monzo gabbros, basalt. It even has a sediment in it. Uh, I've analyzed it, along with my colleague Munir Humayan. And it has zircons in it that are 4 billion 300 4.43 billion years old, so 4,430,000,000 million years old. So this is older than anything we have seen. Guess what I did? I measured the oxygen fugacity of the zircons in that rock. Here's where they plot for Mars. They clearly plot away from the Earth in their own field here. So we now have a window to the atmosphere of Mars 4.43 billion years ago. And then you could say, Steve, so what? Who cares? Why don't we do something with it? Well, uh, I always like a challenge like that. So uh, with Mark Hirschman at the University of Minnesota and Dan Frost and his colleague McCammon at Bayreuth, we've been modeling the uh, gases that would escape on those worlds over four billion years ago at the time life began. Well, uh, I think you can see the difference between Earth and Mars here. This is in Iron Wistite, but uh, uh, over here in this region of log FO2 space, this is uh, phyllite magnetite quartz. Earth, contemporary volcanoes in Iceland, Yellowstone, Pinatubo, uh, uh, Vesuvio, you name it. Mostly water vapor, carbon dioxide, and very small amounts of hydrogen, CO, and methane. Mars, on the other hand, would have equal portions hydrogen and water with methane and carbon dioxide. This is interesting because Mars is old and it is cold. How can Mars possibly have evidence of liquid water running on its surface unless in the very deep past it had a strong greenhouse atmosphere? So I'm pretty excited by this. But then there's more. There's always more. In the geological record, in the one outcrop of the Jack Hills, with, which um, uh, Yozef mentioned, we have measured 210,000 zircons. And we did this by automating the ion microprobe. The oldest one is 4,380,000,000 years old. On the moon, I have measured personally over 200 zircons. The oldest one I have found is 4,417,000,000 years old. And then a Martian zircon, very few, but more or less the same age. Now, in geology, we're kind of like Star Wars. 
In Star Wars, Obi-Wan Kenobi says, in my business, there's no such thing as luck. In our business, there is no such thing as coincidence. If you see a coincidence or something that reminds you of something, for me, alarm bells go off. And I say, I've got to learn more about this. This, interestingly, corresponds to the end of late accretion of the planets. Dynamical studies, which we've just completed, we have papers in, in, published uh, in the last two months on this, show that the start of crust formation, the start of crust formation corresponds to the end of bombardment. And that bombardment was much earlier than previously realized. That the late heavy bombardment which we discussed the translation of, was very, very tiny in comparison to, to this event. So that's the first part. Now putting aside all discussions now of a reduced global geochemical scenario like that advocated by Miller and Urey and so on, it actually leads to the RNA world hypothesis the RNA world hypothesis is a straightforward idea that RNA is a messenger. It's a messenger molecule that you are using and I'm using and you and all living things use as a communicator between DNA and protein synthesis. So DNA instructs RNA to go to protein synthesizer, make proteins and enzymes, to come back and help DNA and the cell perform function. An old idea is that before the king and before the factory, there was the messenger. The messenger is before everybody else because the messenger can rule and make. RNA can catalyze its own reproduction without enzymes. RNA is information and catalysis. That's what the RNA world is. The chemistry of RNA is extremely interesting to a geochemist because RNA is sugar chemistry. RNA is formaldehyde and then everything more complicated than that as a sugar. RNA is water plus CO2 with a photon. That's all you need. Amino acids, on the other hand, don't do much for us, except catalyze production. They taste good in a hamburger. What is the RNA world? RNA has a, a structure that is like a, a, a lady's hairpin. It's flat, generally and it's covered in charge. And because it's flat and it's covered in charge, it wants to be stable. So if you're covered in charges, what do you do to be stable? You close like this. You fold in on yourself, which is what these things do. And in the folds here, proteins can fit and stabilize the structure. RNA viruses have RNA genomes. Ebola is an RNA virus. There are many RNA viruses. No DNA, just RNA. They have very high mutation rates, up to a million times faster than bacteria. RNA viruses are not found in high temperature communities of life. Did you know that? It blew my mind because to me this was a clue. They use nucleotides from the same source, in this case the cell that they invade. They are fundamentally more oxidized chemistry. You make these by CO2 and water and an ultraviolet photon and it does not require a Miller-Urey atmosphere. Great! It's, it's geochemistry. So life is geochemistry. We always knew that, right? There are problems. Yeah. 
I'll tell, my, I'll tell you my problems if you tell me yours. RNA is not very stable. You have to, you have to keep it in cool water. It uh, melts at 50 degrees, which is actually cooler than the Seicheni Jodfurder or someplace. It breaks down with magnesium, calcium, manganese, iron, uh, any salt. So that means the ocean. No. Ocean was always salty because water in contact with rocks leads to salt. So is this a, I think this is a clue where RNA world starts in sweet water, in lakes. However, it stabilizes with phosphate and borate and maybe needs a lake environment to start. Nowadays, where do you find high borate concentration? In desert lakes. A great place to stabilize RNA. Reactions that RNA can catalyze are limited. Well, we've only been working on this for 30 years. Nature had 300 million years to work on. There must be an external source of nucleotides. But this is the same with all sugar scenarios. So it doesn't matter. You need a selection. And it's probably by mineral surfaces. RNA world would have eventually given rise to our world. I think it was an evolutionary innovation to resist heat and salt. Because if you could get to the ocean, you're the winner. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. So in any scenario, a prebiotic soup was always fantastically dilute in a relatively oxidized setting, much like this cartoon, cartoon sir. You were right, it was dishwater in, instead of soup. The chef regrets the error. The last part of my talk is to understand, like Alice here, what's on the other side of the veil, hiding behind there about the crustal platform. And the idea is that I'm going to uh, dispel a notion that I think is preposterous. It's, prepo it's just wrong. And that is that the Hadean Earth was a water planet like this, covered in water with no land. Um, and to figure this out, I have to do some radiogenic isotope geochemistry. But I'll be gentle. And I'll make it fun. I swear, it'll be better than this. OK. So drink me. It isn't poison, what I'm about to show you. I'm going to show you an isotopic system called lutetium hafnium. Lutetium hafnium is a really good, useful system. There, there's a parent isotope, 176 lutetium. It decays to 176 hafnium with a half-life of 38 billion years. Here's the great part of lutetium hafnium. It's lutetium stays in the mantle and hafnium goes in the crust. So it's a long-lived radio, radiogenic system that follows the formation of crust from the mantle. This is how it works. This decays to that with that half-life. So over time, this ratio from here to here from here to here, goes up with time. But it goes up very slowly. You see, here's initial, 0.28. And here's now, 0.2828. So this is a slow growth. This high lutetium hafnium is mantle. Low lutetium hafnium is crust. So let's change it. Let's, say, let's make this the time. And anything here or here 
is a deviation from that evolution. Like that. So this is making continents with time. This is taking out of the mantle and putting it into the continents. So this is the bank, and this is my wallet. Actually, this is my wife, and my, my daughter, and my two sons, and this is my wallet. <laughs> That's great, right? Anyhow, if the Earth changes slowly from its beginning, so that you make a little bit of continent, and a little bit of continent, and a little bit of continent, it takes a long time to change the mantle, right? Because mantle is all of the good stuff, 67%, and the crust is a little skin at the top. So if, if that is true, then it takes a long time before you see high 176, 177 hafnium ratios expressed here. If crust forms very, very early, you should see that. That's the prediction. Good theories make predictions. The beauty is zircon, by the way, this was discovered by uh, George von Hevesi, another great Hungarian. Uh, Hevesi Dürch, so he found, he discovered hafnium, right? He named it after Copenhagen, and he found it in zircon, because zircon, zirconium, and hafnium are isoelectronic. So hafnium substitutes it for zirconium geochemically, and they're this identical uh, charge, identical ionic radius. Hafnium in zircon is about one and a half weight percent. So you get an age and an instantaneous hafnium isotopic value. We did this. This is the record. This is the oldest zircon record over here. And you see that there's some positive here and some negative here. This is mantle extraction. This is building up of continental crust. But something else you see. You see this? Something is changing. Extracting mantle, enriching mantle. Extracting mantle, enriching mantle. This is the heartbeat of the crust. It's this is this um, this changed everything for us because when we saw this. This, um, the latest paper is by my former student, Martin Guitreau. When we saw this, we realized that this is telling us about continental volumes. And it's showing that by four billion years ago, we may have had a few percent of continental area above the water. And then now is the time when you say, so what? Why is that interesting? Okay, here's the world as it should look, I think. Uh, and what is a few percent? Five percent of present continental area is 90 percent of Australia. It's an enormous amount of dry land. And for anyone who has visited Australia or seen photos, it's very dry, many dry lakes, in this case, I think you distributed these around the world. So did we have a water planet? I would say we had a water shrouded world with many, many small islands and island arcs like Tahiti, Philippines, uh, New Zealand, that kind of thing. 
So my conceptual model is this, abundant small protocontinents under a very bright sky with a dense atmosphere of carbon dioxide with a green ocean dominated by iron two dissolved in seawater. And any rocks affected by water equal dry land. Indeed, it is highly likely that emergent land existed in the Hadean. If you take all of the land away, you're not displacing ocean anymore, right? Average depth of the ocean is almost four kilometers. If you take all the land away, it's two kilometers deep. So a two kilometer deep ocean, it's easy to have land above the surface. It's so easy that in some places, like in uh, big, uh, large igneous provinces called lips, in some places you can have peridotite as an island. Here's a peridotite, it's right here. It's the St. Peter and St. Paul archipelago. It's between Brazil and West Africa. It's here. It's not very big. However, this is all olivine. It's, it's amazing. This thing rises three kilometers from the seafloor, and it's in the middle of the ocean. Here are my conclusions that I wish to discuss with you and debate with you, and I invite all of you to join us, of course, with coffee at the Kutatoi Kaveze, Tudosh Kaveze, afterwards, and we'll clink glasses with this. But the first habitats for life quickly appeared. I told you that um, 4.43 billion is when the crust formed. Water was there soon after. That's a mere 50 million years after the solar system. Cosmochemically, Earth-like planets should have an oxidized mantle. Not hydrogen-rich, but carbon dioxide-rich. That liquid water is primordial to the Earth. Actually, hardly any came by comets. It's a primary accretion source building the planet itself. That bombardments only matter if you melt everything. You have to make an ocean of magma to kill all life. Planets form hot any time a hot rock meets liquid water. You make a hydrothermal system, which gives you chemistry and equilibrium is maintained over geologic timescales by melting rock. I think you have to melt a rock to reset the planetary battery. No volcanism, no crust recycling, can be no life. That concludes my presentation for today. I wish to thank the Modior Tudomanios Academia for this great honor. I'm truly honored. Um, and it's also, this is anecdotal, but my family originated here in Trenchen in Felvidek in the 18th century. They moved down the Vag River to Ipoishag and then after to, um, to Nograd Medje. And so, uh, when I walked into the room, I was astonished to see the beautiful paintings here of the uh, Vag Foyo, uh, because I feel, uh, as I shared with uh, Paul Garimarta, my colleague there, with whom we wrote a you wrote a beautiful paper. I'm so happy to be on this paper on manganese carbonates from Urkut that I feel I come full circle to my own Honfoglalash here. And thank you all very, very much. And I look forward to many more opportunities to meet together. Thank you. Köszönjük szépen Steve előadását. 
Azt gondolom, mindannyian élveztük, így nem marad más hátra számomra, mint hogy átadjam a mai nap ezt az oklevelet, amelyet Lovász László, a Magyar Tudományos Akadémia elnöke írt alá, amely igazolja, dokumentálja, hogy Steve J. Moldis professzor a Magyar Tudományos Akadémia külső tagjává választotta, és ennek a székfoglaló előadásnak a megtartásával kötelezettségeinek is elégettett 